he's still got the whole world in his hands. A couple of weeks ago, the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper released a poll that showed that more people, more than half of the people in our state, are afraid that New South Wales could be forced back into lockdown in a similar way to Victoria. About half the people in our state are concerned that our state and international borders won't open anytime soon. 60% of the people in our state are concerned about the ongoing recession and financial instability we're going to face going into next year. I suspect those figures have changed a bit in the last week or so. But one thing is certain, there is a lot of uncertainty about. Fair few people have described this time as unprecedented, right? As though this level of uncertainty and upheaval is something new. Well, this is perhaps true in our own lifetimes, but historically, as a human species, we've faced far greater plagues, far deeper recessions. Also, Remembrance Day is coming this week, a day that marks the end of the First World War, the Great War, the war to end all wars, and among other things, it should remind us that we, as a species, have faced much more devastating times of violence and political upheaval. But also think for a moment about your own individual life. Most of us have faced far greater personal challenges and situations than this. I know many of you, I know that you have faced health challenges, family issues, financial hardship, addiction issues, relational issues, and significant grief and loss. The truth is, as a species and as individuals, Difficulty, struggle, pain and hardship are nothing new. In fact, difficulty, struggle, pain and uncertainty are times when God does his greatest work. I'm sure many of you can testify to that. And those are the times where we are most attentive to God, when our families, our cities, our nations are most likely to pray. These are times when we learn most about who God is and who we are. One of the most famous Bibles verses says this, in all things, that includes pandemics, politics, and HSC exams, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. So history shows us, the Bible teaches us, and many of us can testify to the fact that God is always working in all things. But here's the big question for us today. What do we do in the meantime? What are we supposed to do while suffering pain and stress and uncertainty? What are we supposed to do when uncertainty becomes more uncertain? What are we supposed to do as the world descends further into lockdown? Economies contract and crumble. What are we supposed to do when families seem further and further away? What are we supposed to do when we get lonelier and lonelier? What are we supposed to do when our, our business partners abandon us? What do we do when our businesses contract and we can no longer make ends meet? or we lose our jobs? What are we supposed to do when God doesn't seem to be answering our prayers? Well, this morning I invite you to turn with me to Philippians 4, verses 4 to 9. This is Paul writing to a church that he started in a city called Philippi. Before I read these verses, I want to just say that if there is anyone who understood pain, uncertainty, and persecution, it was Paul. So he has some credibility in this space, which is important when we read in a moment. He was a successful church planter. He, he was world famous, but he was a very big target of the establishment. He was hounded, hassled, beaten, imprisoned, shipwrecked more than once, and stoned, and not in the drugs way, with rocks. He was imprisoned, eventually, in the, well, to start with, in the basement of a palace in the Middle East for a couple of years, until he was moved to Rome. And there he was supposed to have an audience with the emperor, but eventually he was executed. So it might seem like what he says here to the church in Philippi seems incredibly impractical or even insensitive, but you cannot really fault the source. If anyone should know how to respond in desperate, difficult and uncertain times, it's this guy. Well, he begins. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. <laughs> you see how this might be seen as insensitive? Oh, you have cancer? Rejoice in the Lord always. Oh, your husband or wife left you? Rejoice in the Lord always. Oh, your kid was in a car accident? Rejoice in the Lord always. Obviously, Paul has no clue, right? He's writing from 2,000 years ago. He has no idea. Well, let me highlight something in this sentence. I think we get hung up on the command to rejoice. and We, we don't pay enough attention to the phrase, in the Lord. But you see, that's the key part of the sentence. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. 
It doesn't say rejoice in your new job always. It doesn't say rejoice in your new boyfriend or girlfriend always. It doesn't say rejoice in your new car. It doesn't say rejoice in your wealth when your retirement fund goes up. It doesn't say rejoice in your scholarship. It doesn't say rejoice in your success. It doesn't say any of that. It also doesn't say rejoice in your relationship breakdown. It, it doesn't say rejoice in your grief. It doesn't say rejoice in your dying business. It only says rejoice in the Lord. I sometimes think we, we read this and we assume Paul is saying that we should dismiss or disregard our circumstances. He's not. He simply says that in the middle of all your circumstances, good and bad, circumstances that make you want to celebrate or sob, stop for a time and remember the reality of Jesus. Remember the reality of his suffering on a cross for you. Remember that incredible act of love carried out with you in mind. Here's the power of what Paul is saying. He, he says, don't just remember. He says, rejoice. He says, rejoice, which means to keep remembering that reality until your emotions reflect the reality. To rejoice is to focus on the reality of God's love for you shown through Jesus' death on the cross and to keep focusing on that reality until your emotions start to catch up with the thought and you begin to truly feel a sense of gratitude and appreciation for who God is and what he has done for you. In these times of uncertainty and pain, we should start reminding yourself of the grace and mercy and love of the one who was crucified with you, for you. Remind yourself until reality is reflected in your reactions. Reflect until your emotions catch up with reality. So he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Seriously, do it. He says, rejoice. But then he continues. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. In other words, don't let hard times turn you into a sour old crank. Really, don't let your fuse get so short with your circumstances that you blow up the relationships around you. Think about this. If your joy is associated only with the good times and the good circumstances in your life, then when circumstances erode and crumble, then so will your character. You will become short-tempered. You will become very difficult to live with and, and so on. Again, though, if your character is based on what God is doing inside you, if you continually rejoice in the Lord for what he's done inside you, focusing on what he did for you, then the circumstances will not be as strong in trying to control your character. Your gentleness will be evident, obvious, and even attractive to others. It'll be as though your ability to handle difficult circumstances with grace and strength will make other people wonder what's different about you. How do you handle things like that? How do you survive and continue to thrive in the worst of circumstances? Okay, well, let's continue. And I remind you, these are Paul's words, not mine. Okay, Paul had an incredibly painful and difficult life. And with that in mind, Paul then says, don't be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious. Don't be stressed out. Don't be distracted by your emotions. That's pretty, uh, well, it's not very helpful advice, is it? I mean, have you ever told someone something that you're concerned about? And they've just said something like, oh, don't worry about it. And you just want to slap them? You got an exam tomorrow? Don't worry about it. Got to go into surgery next week? Don't worry about it. Oh, you lost your job? Don't worry about it. Oh, you caught that disease? Don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. It's not a very sensitive or sensible sort of response, is it? It's, it's actually pretty dumb. Oh, so thanks for the advice. I hadn't thought about that. I'll just turn it off like a light bulb and I won't worry about it. It'll just disappear. It's nonsense, right? So what is Paul saying? How exactly are we supposed to do this? What is he on about? It seems like nonsense. Sometimes I think I want to slap Paul for saying it. But you want, you want to know something? It's only half a sentence. It's only half the point. Paul says this, every time you're overwhelmed with worry or anxiety, every time you start to go under because of your circumstances, he doesn't say simply switch it off. He says immediately do this instead. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Okay, so if you boil this down to a simple instructions, it does simply sound like Paul's saying, instead of worrying, just pray. And that's dumb, right? What do you think I've been doing all along, Paul? We've been doing nothing else but praying, Paul. What are you talking about, Paul? Is this whole sermon a simple statement of the obvious? 
Well, no, and, and yes, Paul does say prayer and petition in an attitude of thanksgiving is the way to go. He does say that in times of worry and anxiety, we need to present our requests to God. But there is much more to this phrase than we might think. In fact, what it boils down to is this word to present, to present your requests to God. The word present means literally to reveal, to uncover. In Greek theatre, this is the word used to describe that moment when the great mystery is revealed. The detective or whoever solves the case and the evidence is uncovered, lined up, and the true culprit is unmasked. You see, it's a much more profound word than it looks, isn't it? Paul is saying we need to spend whatever time it takes to uncover and understand ourselves and then to reveal to God what is that which we really, really deeply in the bottom part of our heart and soul desire. On the surface, we desire a job. On the surface, we need to sell our home. Or on the surface, we need to pass an exam. Whatever it is, though, that drives those surface requirements, what is it underneath that contributes to those worries? What is it that builds the anxiety? And this is a solution that Paul is talking about. In times of uncertainty, you know, sorry, in, in times of uncertainty, often the, our, our deepest anxieties get stirred up. Our, our deepest fears are shaken loose a little. And they start to float to the surface and they contribute to all sorts of fears and anxieties over other things. And Paul is saying that we need to uncover those, to reveal them to God and unload them onto God. You can pray. You can pray at the surface level and you, and you should pray at the surface level. God, help me find my car keys or, or a car spot. Or even, God, help me pass this exam. Or, or even you should be praying, God, help me get through my surgery tomorrow. That's one I've used a few times. But it's not really what Paul is saying we should pray about. In uncertain times, when the ground is shifting on your feet, when we're feeling things we've never felt, when we're experiencing things we've never experienced before, Paul is saying we need to pray in ways we've never prayed before. We need to get on our knees, unless, of course, you're going to have knee surgery. Uh, we, we need to get serious is what he's saying. And get into prayer, not only to tell God what we want, but to tell God why we want it. We need to tell God what we really fear. You know what sometimes happens? Sometimes, uh, in my experience, when we spend time seriously in prayer like this, sometimes we start and we don't really know what our fears are. We don't really know what's driving our anxiety and our, and our sense of being overwhelmed. And as we pray, sometimes other fears and thoughts that are contributing to our anxiety become revealed to us. God works within us. We can take those on board, acknowledge those, and hand those to God as well. Uncertainty surfaces my deepest insecurities and my deepest values. Personally, when I move past the surface level stuff in my life, what's behind all these legitimate requests kind of comes to the surface. My concern for my security and my family, my, my continual need to feel validated or to feel important or to feel approved of by my peers, my fear that perhaps God doesn't truly know my name, all these deep, dark fears come to the surface. Paul says, come on, I want you to explore and dig up all that stuff. Bring it to God. Having, having first understood all that he's done for you, bring it to God until you discover the deepest, darkest, most basic, most hidden desires and fears and insecurities. Why is it a big deal to you? Why are you concerned about that? Why is that so important to you? Why are you worried about that? Why, why, why? What's underneath all of that, Paul says? Bring that to your heavenly father. And then Paul says, the result is that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And that is my prayer for all of you this morning. Finally, brothers and sisters, we say, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. God bless you.